think of what you're doing this very second. You're listening to my voice. You are listening to what I'm saying. And you're probably thinking over the words that I am saying, and you're trying to understand what I mean. Now, this seems like a fairly straightforward thing to do. In fact, it's probably extremely easy and natural thing for you to do, so much so that it doesn't really cost you much effort. And in fact, um, you very rarely think about what a marvelous feat this actually is. Think about what it takes for you to accomplish what you're doing right now. First, my voice or perhaps the speakers uh, that you're listening my voice through um, is not quite emitting words. It's emitting series of pressure waves um, which reach your ear and inside your ear, like any other sound, get decoded and uh, by their frequency inside your inner ear. Then you have to recognize that the pattern of pressure waves that is hitting your inner ear is not just any random pattern of pressure waves. It's actually a pattern that happens to correspond to the noises or sounds that uh, you have learned are part of the special category of noises that are used in the English language. Then you have to figure out how this continuous stream of um, sounds actually segments into units of meaning, perhaps words. And for this, obviously, you have to access your repertoire of knowledge of English vocabulary. Then, once you've translated sounds into words, you actually need to figure out uh, how the words um, are strung together in one or more sentences. Maybe what's the syntactic structure that unites them? And that ultimately allows you to understand what exactly I am trying to say and allows you to form a mental representation of the message I am trying to convey. Now, said this way, and I could have gone in much more detail of each of these steps, uh, it does sound much more complicated, but it's actually much worse. First, I clearly have an accent. So the sound waves that I'm producing are not exactly the sound waves that you expect. This means that at times, um, stuff might reach your ear um, in ways that are not clear to you. Meaning, I might mispronounce something so bad that you don't know what I'm saying. Now, when that happens, and it happens fairly often, what you're going to do is you're going to use your knowledge of English, your understanding of the context, your understanding of what I've said up to a certain point to try to fill in spontaneously. If that doesn't happen, you will find yourself um, at the decision point where you have to decide whether uh, what I was saying was so incomprehensible that you either interrupt me if we are in a face-to-face -face, um, uh, conversation, or you find the time, desire, and effort to send me an email to ask me what exactly did I mean. So throughout all of this, you are taking live decisions second by second about what to do with the message that is reaching you. On top of it, sure, you're hearing my voice, but probably there are a million other things competing for your attention. Maybe there's a TV in the background. Maybe your roommate is having a loud conversation. Maybe your phone is buzzing in your pocket right now, leaving you with the conundrum, do I keep listening or do I find out who's texting me? Um, you know, or maybe there's that one tense conversation you had two weeks ago with your good friend or your family member or your significant other that just keeps mulling over in your mind and keeps distracting you from listening to this particular lecture. Um, and of course, while on the one hand, I want to tell you, no, no, keep listening, um, there obviously is a threshold um, that if met, would make you divert your attention. Um, what if you're waiting for a very important text? What if you're waiting for a very important news from a friend, family member, maybe from some medical result? What if that conversation that your, your um, roommate is having um, is having them very distraught, is having them in tears? Wouldn't you want to stop this and to go see them and, 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 offer, uh, and offer your support? Um, and a friendly ear. Um, th there obviously are um, 
throughout this process, there are a number of decisions that you are taking live and you're solving second by second. What if suddenly you smell smoke? You'd want to stop instantly listening to me and find out where that smell is coming from. So there's a number of incentives. There's a number of different things that are competing for your attention. And you have to keep at every second, not just to decode what I am saying, you have to keep deciding if you want to continue doing that or if there's something else more important that should take precedence. So see, even something as mundane and as superficially so simple as listening to someone is actually a nonstop of very complicated processes and decisions. Now, the collection of processes that allow you to acquire information from the world and create intelligent behavior is what we refer to as cognition. Now, cognition can be studied in a number of different ways. Um, typically, cognitive psychology is concerned with studying and understanding how the human mind, um, and what processes it uses in order to uh, create intelligent behavior. And typically the processes that we study encompass perception, attention, memory, problem solving, decision making, reasoning, language, and many others. A different way of approaching uh, the question of human cognition is neuroscience. Um, in fact, we often refer to a particular branch of neuroscience as cognitive neuroscience. And and this approach is typically concerned with studying the brain itself and how neurons and, and groups of neurons together, acting in circuits and networks, implement um, these processes and give, give rise to these processes. Finally, um, a particularly uh, interesting and, 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 and a, a, a subfield that is definitely uh, gaining momentum steadily over the last uh, 15, 20 years is artificial intelligence. And the idea is to use computer-based simulations. In fact, today, computer-based simulations that are inspired and they're structured uh, by the human brain, um, for which reason, a reason for which we often refer to these as neural networks. And the idea is to try to understand how cognition works, how human cognition works, by, by trying to recreate it. Um, in these simulations. The promise, of course, of artificial intelligence is, by the is that by the process of recreating intelligent behaviors in machine, we might be able to back engineer and thus understand how the mind works. And I have to say, and the book gives you a really interesting perspective on this, one of the biggest surprises um, in the field of engineering um, in the 20th century has been the understanding of how difficult it is to build a machine that can produce the kind of intelligent behavior that we apparently can do with great ease. It turns out it's very easy to create a calculator. It's very easy to create something that can calculate um, things that for us appear very complicated, like taking the square root of 2045. Um, on the other hand, it's extremely tough to build a machine that can do the type of the type of things that we take for granted. You know, recognizing an object for what it is. Right now, you're looking at me. You see a face, and it, it doesn't take you but a heartbeat to recognize that the object in front of you is a face. It's tough to do that with a computer. We're now learning how to do that. We're now being um, now. Uh, computer simulations are starting to be able to do that, but it's been a persistent challenge. Or how about understanding language? That's another area that is finally blossoming with things such as um, language recognition software, but it's been a major challenge and it still is. How about making dinner? How about deciding which of the 5,300 colleges in the U.S. you should apply to for, um, for undergrad? These things are extremely difficult to model. 